Today's show is an AMA, Ask Me Anything, but first, I'm gonna give you a little update about a few things we've got coming in the weeks ahead. Good morning and welcome to Photo Justice Photo Moment, the first live show here on YouTube, talking about photography, video, and all that good stuff every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. First live photo show every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You get the idea. You know what it is. We are here at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time at youtube.com slash photojoseph talking about anything camera, video, photo related. If it's got a lens or camera attached to it, I figure it's fair game for this discussion. And that's what we do here on this show. Normally, if you've never seen the show before, normally we have a very specific topic. Today is one of those AMA shows. Just kind of whatever you want to know about, throw it out there. We'll chit chat. This could be a 20 minute show. This could be like a three hour show. I really have no idea. If you're here just for the AMA, we're going to put a time somewhere here, oh, um, you can scrub to that because I'm going to first do a little bit of just kind of pre-update just on things that are coming up in the in the weeks ahead because there's a lot going on at once and I just want to kind of show you everything that's, that's happening and then we'll get into the show itself. So this is some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks, month, and so on. Um, first up, I, and I'm not really going to do a proper unboxing because it's a tripod, it's, it's not that exciting of an unboxing. But I want to show this to you. So I have, as you guys know, when we're on the studio camera, the camera that rolls around back here, it doesn't actually roll. It's just on a tripod. And you've seen as Ryan moved it around, he picks up the tripod and moves it. So I wanted to get a rolling tripod. And you can spend a lot of money on a rolling tripod, or you can try and go cheap. I try to go cheap because I've spent way too much money on everything else around here. So I uh, reached out to B&H and kind of talked to their, their sales folks and spec together a tripod that I think is going to work out very well in here. And the whole thing comes out at, I think like 250 bucks or something like that. It's a really good price for a tripod with rolling wheels. So that's what this is. So it's got the wheels on it so that we can roll it around. It's got a handle so that Ryan should be able to move the camera. He can reach up to do his focus and zoom. Um, we looked at even having the power zoom because I do have a power zoom lens, but it's a variable aperture and I just don't like that in the studio. So it's, it's just better to have the fixed aperture. Manual zoom, but that's okay. Ryan can reach over and can control the zoom. The tripod should be sturdy enough. The wheels on there hopefully are big enough. This is my big concern is my floor are these plastic tiles that are snapped together. So there's a tiny little ridge between each tile. And my concern is that the wheels might kind of bump over that and you'd see that jostle in the camera. So we'll find out. But that is something that we will be working with and then I'll be talking about how well it's worked out for me or not uh, in a future show. But I'm not gonna do an unboxing because it's, it's a tripod, but that is something we're gonna be doing. On Wednesday's show, uh, here, actually, I'm going to bring up a graphic for this. On Wednesday's show, we're going to do a show about black and white photography using color filters. This is going to be really interesting, I think. This is going to be a lot of fun. So I got this filter pack from K&F that was really quite inexpensive. Um, it came with more colors than I need for this. And we're going to do some, some experiments, some showing the differences of with certain filters without. Because we can do set the camera to black and white and see through the viewfinder black and white, I can actually do that live, which is crazy cool. So I'm looking forward to that. That's gonna be on Wednesday. This company called Pixco reached out to me and they make adapters to adapt your Canon lens. They have for pretty much every lens manufacturer, um, adapt your lens to another camera. And so I asked them to send me a couple of Canon adapters for Micro Four Thirds. Now these are not Metabones adapters. These are, these have no glass in them but this will adapt my Canon lenses to my Lumix cameras. I have no idea what the difference is. There's two of them. I don't know why there's two, I don't know, but we're gonna find out. So they sent me these to play with. Um, they've got, look at this. This one has an aperture in it, which is really quite interesting because it's a stepless aperture, which is quite nice. So I guess you can leave the Canon lens wide open, stepless, I know. Very inexpensive compared to the Metabones, but of course there's no glass in them, so you're not getting the, uh, the light amplification, but I don't know, we're gonna play with it. So I wanted to show you these. I do an unboxing, except I just did. Take it out and that's the box, it's not exciting. So I will be playing with those and reporting back on those. If this works out well, I think that's a pretty awesome, inexpensive way to get old Canon glass or Nikon or whatever you got onto your Micro Four Thirds deal. Try not to break this. Um, I talked about this briefly before, the Lens Baby Velvet Lens. I am going to do a show on it. I was trying to set up something for Valentine's Day. I was gonna do something because it's all soft and right, and I've got a red backdrop there we can shoot against that. Um, I, that might still happen. The girl that I was gonna use is gonna be out of town, so uh, I need to see if I can sort that out in time, but uh, one way or another, we're gonna talk about that lens sooner or later. I feel like I'm missing something. Maybe that's everything I wanted to tell you. Okay, <laughs> I think that's everything. Oh no, there was one more thing. Um, shoot, 
and it's not here. But Angel Bird, Angel Bird, the memory card manufacturer, they have sent me a couple of cards to review. And so I've just got them in the camera. I haven't done anything real with it. Like I haven't shot at 400 megabit or, or any of that yet. But um, I do have a couple of those cards now. So I don't, sorry, I don't have them here to show you. But the Angel Bird cards, I will finally be looking at and finally being able to shoot in 400 megabit. I haven't had fast enough cards to do that with. So now I do. So with that said, now let's get into the proper show. Now we're going to do the AMA. Let me see, I know there's a question that already came up that I said let's get into that when we get to the AMA, so let me just scroll through the comments here. Uh, for those watching live, if you have a question for the show, just put it in the comments. Make sure you type at Photo Joseph in front of it. That way I can see the question. I know there's a question there and I will address it. If it doesn't have that, then I, I might miss it and might not get to it. Um, also, if you really, really love me and, and want to support the show a little bit, there's a little dollar sign down there. You can click on that and then you can make a contribution and ask your question that way. You don't have to, but you know, it's kind of cool. It helps. Every little penny helps here. All right. First question comes up, Bruce Bruton, Bruton, Bruton says, good morning, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you, Bruce. I can tell I'm very excited, I'm in a good mood today. I got a small rig cage, I thought I said rib cage at first, I thought, well, that's a bit odd. Small rig cage for my G7. Okay, my question is, if you know, can I still use my external flash in the camera's hot shoe with the cage on? Well, that's gonna depend on the cage, whether it is shaped around the hot shoe, which I would think most cages would be. Uh, where's Ryan, can you grab my, uh, the camera with the cage over there? Uh, the cage that Ryan's gonna, it's, it's on the, I'm pointing and he's not even looking, he has no idea what I'm pointing at, it's on the big table. Uh, the cage that I have is for video use and so by default, it doesn't really, thank you very much, mm -hmm. it would be, uh, you'd put a handle over where the hot shoe would be so that kind of blocks it. However, in this case, and this is the, for the GH5, this is the small rig cage, I've talked about this guy before, this has, I, I didn't originally buy this because I didn't think I was going to want it, but then Sean, my buddy Sean, who you've seen here before, uh, he sold me his because he decided he didn't need his, but this is called a helmet or something like that. Let me get these off so they don't make that noise. This attaches on top of here, allowing room for the XLR1 adapter to fit on here, and then I can still put other stuff on top of this. That's not a flash, obviously. We're not talking flashes here, but this cage, if I take this handle off, would allow a flash to go in, right? There's a space for that. Um, I think you can kind of see that on there. Try to see that, kind of sort of see that on there. Um, there is room for it. So, let's see, actually, maybe I can do a, where's my top down, is my top down camera on? Yeah, here we go. Uh, I just, I rearranged all of this now and I'm still trying to figure out where everything is. Where's my, oh yeah, overhead, there we go. So there you can see, there's plenty of room. If I took this handle off, there'd be plenty of room to put a flash on there. But given that this is set up for video, obviously I don't need the flash on there. So there's that, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, without answering, without knowing your exact model or being able to look at that, I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry, Bruce. All right, let's see here. Ricardo says, can you tell me the name of your ear monitors? Oh, yes, my inner monitors are, I don't have the case here, I forget. They're actually very nice, except that I'm having issues with them popping out now, now and then. Um, they don't have the name on there. Hmm. I will have to link to that below. I'm sorry. We'll put a link to that down below because I don't remember the name of it. I've had them for a couple years now. The case for them is not here, which means it's in a box over there, which I'm not going to go digging through right now. Uh, I will have to put a link down below, so you have to come back and look for that later. Sorry, I don't have an answer for you right off. But I know that I did have to buy the flesh-colored wires separately, and those had to be custom-ordered. This all came from Sweetwater. It was a little annoying that I had to get these separately think that that would just be normal that most people would want flesh colored ones but so they have them in stock in various skin colors but they didn't they had to order them separately anyway so but they're great they sound great um the problem that i have well the problem they're wired M one of my next investments for the show is going to be wireless monitors i think they will come i think it's a sennheiser pack that i've gotten my shopping cart i don't remember but they come with their own earphones, but I will, I will most likely still use these earphones because these are really nice, invisible, kind of wrap around and so on, and then just hook those up to the wireless pack. That's the plan. Do Lumix do Lamborghinis, SRO Digital? Not that I'm aware of, but I'll take one if they do. Uh, Matthew Wolf, I just bought the Panasonic G9. Awesome with a 14 to 140 LED. It's double awesome. What is your view? Oh, my view is it's awesome. Also, what are your views of UHS-1 versus UHS-2 SD cards? Okay, so uh, the G9, love the camera, obviously, I've talked about it before, did some comparison videos, G9 is fantastic. 14 to 140 lens I actually have not shot with, but I hear good things, but I'm sorry, I don't have any personal experience with it. UH1 versus UH2, I'm gonna link right up here to a show that we did a while ago about cards, explaining 
all the differences, what all the different numbers mean, and so on. The UHS-2, if I'm going to get this right, since too much information goes into this thing I call a brain and then falls right back out again. If I'm remembering right, the UHS-2 cards are the ones that have the double row of pins, which, no, it's not in there, um, which are the, what the new Angel Bird cards that I just got have. Those allow the much faster read and write time. If I'm getting that wrong and that's not what UHS-2 UHS is, then just smack me, but um, watch the show and that explains everything. <clears throat> the faster cards, though, the benefit of faster cards are, first of all, if you're shooting video, there are certain spec cards that will not sustain the data rate that you're pushing to the card if you're shooting a really high-end video. So if you're shooting like 4K 60p, if you're shooting this 400 megabit and so on, you need the fastest, fastest cards or the card will simply go, oh, can't write that fast and it stops recording. If you're shooting stills, the faster the card, the faster the buffer is going to clear. So if you're just a casual shooter, you're never gonna know the difference, but if you're shooting sports and you're shooting full on, you know, 10 frames per second out of your camera, um, and you just hold that shutter down, you could end up hitting the buffer, filling the buffer, bef uh, and stop having to stop shooting because the card's going, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, just give me a second here to write the data. So the faster cards will either eliminate that or at least reduce it. So faster cards are always better if you're shooting video, especially 4K video, if you're shooting um, stills and shooting a lot of stills in rapid succession. If you're doing neither of those things, you can get away with the slower cards. However, one more thing to point out is that if you have a slow card, it's not just the write time, it's also the read time. So when you take your slower card, if you put it into a fast card reader, <clears throat> excuse me, you still have to have a good reader for this, put in a fast card reader, put it in your computer, and you're going, why is it taking so long to copy the pictures off the card? Well, because the card is slow. Well, the bottleneck in that case could be the card. So all things to consider. If you're up against deadlines, if you're hurrying, if you're shooting the Olympics and you need to you know, get those pictures off, you got 15 minutes to turn around and get those pictures off to the, um, off to the press, then you want the fastest cards available. If, if you don't need it, if you're not shooting high, high uh, frame rate video, or sorry, high um, bit rate video, if you're not shooting a lot of stills frames per second, high frame per second, if, getting, if time getting the pictures off your card is not a concern, then you could probably save your money and buy slower cards. So there you go, okay. Uh, Oops, scrolled past, and of course the thing just scrolled all over the place. There it is. <laughs> Does S1 Digital do Subarus have a 360 degree stabilized camera mount option with cellular signal booster? Not stock, but I'm sure you can add one on. Tolman, if anybody who didn't see the pre-show is wondering, I got a new car, I got a Subaru, and so I was just showing the pre-show folks the car, and that's why they're asking. Tolman says, if you get too many bumps, maybe you can put down some tripod tracks. Oh, no, 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 we're not putting down tripod tracks. I'm talking about the this thing sliding around. Um, no, because I need to have full freedom of movement all over the studio. This is not like a, a tracked shot where it goes from A to B. This is this needs to have the flexibility to move anywhere. So, nice suggestion, but no, that's way beyond the kind of thing that I want to do in here. Luca Schur says, hey, I just bought a GH5 with the 21.7 Panasonic pancake lens. Awesome. I haven't played with that lens. That's supposed to be a very nice lens. Um, is it enough for nightclub filming? Well, it's certainly fast. I mean, at 1.7, I think you're going to be uh, you're going to do pretty good. Uh, if you're shooting handheld, then the GH5 is a good choice. It's got the stabilization. I don't think that lens has built-in stabilization, so you've got just the body. Uh, if you were shooting super low light and were on sticks, on a tripod, or on a gimbal, then of course the GH5S might be a better example. But uh, which, incidentally, ooh, here I'll link to this video as well. So Max Yuryev, you guys know him from some of our <laughs> infamous banter here on this show. He just got back from an event in New York that Panasonic put on, inviting some YouTubers over to take a look at the GH5S. They set up a thing in the McKittrick Hotel, I think that's what it was. This whole super, super low light, like theater type event where people all dressed up in kind of 20s era clothing and having cocktails and pouring drinks and chatting with each other. And then the, the invited guests were able to pick up a GH5S and go shoot it. He's, the, as far as I know, he's the first one to release a video around it. Um, definitely worth watching, very impressive footage, looks fantastic and low light. He shot some of it with a gimbal, so he had his own, you know, adding his own stabilization into it. Um, really worth checking out. So again, we'll link to that up here. Do check th that thing out. But if you are shooting in that low light situation, then the GH5S is probably the best camera for that. But you're working with the GH5 with that 20mm lens, f1.7. You know, I, I think that the uh, GH5 does remarkably well in low light. Obviously the GH5S is gonna do better, but yeah, we'll see what you get. You haven't said if you're doing video or stills either. We said filming, so let's assume video. You know, I think you're gonna be fine. You, you'll 
you'll have to experiment and try it. There's no, it's enough. Every nightclub has different amounts of light. What's the situation? But make sure you're shooting manual. Don't try and shoot auto because all the flashing lights are going to confuse the heck out of your camera and you can have your exposure going all over the place. So shoot manual. Um, exposure, you might want to shoot manual focus because there's going to be so much moving around, low light, the camera might not quite figure out what to focus on. But that's where focus peaking can really come in handy. You're going to have to experiment. There's no easy answer to it. Give it a try and see what happens. Brent asks, when am I getting a GH5S? Apparently this week. I was told one was shipping to me on Friday, last Friday. I don't have a tracking number, but I'm hoping it's just going to magically show up at some point very, very soon. Uh, Anthony says, would you recommend GH5 to a beginner? Well, if you can afford it, why not? The camera will last you for a very, very long time, but it is certainly way more capable than most what most beginners need. If you're a beginner in the sense of, I don't know what I, I don't know if I even want to have a camera, if it's something I'm gonna do for a long time or something I'm just playing with, that's probably a bit overkill. Uh, but, you know, hey, if you got the money, why not, right? It's like people who buy Leicas who are just playing with photography on the site. If you can afford it, go for it. GH5 is a fantastic camera. Uh, overkill for most beginners, but hey, I'm not gonna tell you not to buy one. It's pretty awesome. Uh, all right, let's see here. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't have, I thought I had these comments up this whole time. Um, Bruce, Bor uh, Bruce Bruton says, I got to, oh wait, we already hit that. How did we get, oh, you probably repost, copy and pasted that in. Samir says, what do you think of the new GH5 autofocus hack? Don't know anything about this. By changing the shutter angle from 180 to 150 for much improvement of autofocus. I have not heard of that. Doesn't sound like a hack, sounds more like a, uh, uh, a tip, but I haven't heard of that. Please feel free to post a link. Ryan, are people able to post links now? You said something the other day about maybe we could do that. Okay, Ryan is going to approve you, Samir, right now so that you can paste a link in. Go ahead and paste that link into the show notes, uh, into the comments here, and then we'll grab that. We'll be able to put that down below as well. Oh, he can't, he can't do it. Apparently he can't do it. He's making stuff up now. Have you ever commented on a video, Samir? I don't know. Just get me the link one way or another. Um, Brent says, also, if you don't have room for a flash, can't you use one of those offset cables for flash? Because so, now we're talking about the, the cage and a flash again. Yes, absolutely. That's a very, very good point. If you wanted to, if you were using a cage setup, let's say you had something like this for your still camera, not with a monitor probably, and for whatever reason the cage setup didn't allow you, let's just say like this handle was permanent on there. That's a good example. Let's say this handle was permanent. I could not put a flash here. You could use an off-camera flash cable, a TTL cable. You slide that in there and then you put your flash elsewhere. And usually it's better for the flash not to be right over the lens, so it'd probably be better anyway. But that's a very good point. Thank you for mentioning that. A cable like that would absolutely help you if the, uh, if the cage is getting in the way of your flash. All right, uh, let's see here. We hit that. And Capturing Media says, curious, would the Epifan X2, that's the hardware box for doing live streaming, be good for running out of the Blackmagic Studio HD to stream to the stream to YouTube or Facebook, or do you have a better option for under a thousand dollars? Blackmagic Studio HD, that's the new switcher, right? Let me let me pull this up real quick. I think that's the new switcher to do basically what I do, but on a smaller scale. Uh, let me just pull up the Blackmagic website and make sure that I am thinking about the same thing. So let's see here. Let's go to this. And it's the Blackmagic Studio products and um, switchers. And Blackmagic broadcast panels, studio convert. Nope, it's time to see that there. Oh, here we go, the television studio. This is what you're talking about, right? The ATM television studio. I think this is what you mean. Um, Blackmagic Studio HD. I'm pretty sure this is what you're talking about. Okay, so this handles all the switching. And then you still need something to handle the encoding. So just for anybody who's not clear on how this stuff works, if you're doing a live show, you can you have multiple segments of how things come together. You've got your camera switching, which is what I'm doing here where it allows me to do things like switch to a close-up camera, my overhead camera, or the, the primary camera, or just show the comments, or uh, all that stuff. That's all part of the switching process. Um, that is typically handled separately from the encoding and streaming, which in itself is two parts. The video stream, the program it's called, has to be encoded into something that can be live streamed, and then that encoded stream has to be pushed to the internet. So it's kind of a two-step process there. If you're using software like Wirecast, it does everything all at once, but many regular viewers know my disdain for software encoders and switchers because they're just not reliable and you start trying to do too much and everything falls apart very quickly. Hardware, like the ATEM Television Studio or the ATEM 2ME, which is what I use, a much bigger version of this, are fantastic because they do all your switching in hardware. It's rock solid, totally reliable, but they don't do the encoding. So from there, you have to somehow encode and stream it. 
Um, I used to use Wirecast here for that, just for the encoding and streaming. We're now using the Epifan Pearl 2, which is a much more capable, bigger, higher-end box. The X2 is a smaller, still very capable, small hardware streaming box that allows you to take any HDMI input and stream it to the web. And it streams to either YouTube, Facebook, or something else, not Twitch. Maybe it is Twitch. They added something else to it. Anyway, um, it's not kind of an and do anything streamer, but if you're going live to YouTube or Facebook, it's great. It's only 300 bucks, 250, yeah, 300. Uh, it's, it's a great bargain. It's very good quality, not as good quality as the Pearl 2, which is an $8,000 hardware encoder, but it is still a very, very good quality hardware streamer. And yes, I think that would be a great option because you can take your switching hardware, plug it directly in, and now you've got all your switching in one device, you're streaming on another, and you're good to go. If you wanted to go super lightweight, you could just take a camera, take your GH5, plug it into the X2, and go live from that, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, there's definitely options to, go, to do it that way. So I would say, yes, that is a very good, low-cost solution. There's actually nothing else that I've used, not to say there's nothing else on the market, nothing else that I've used anywhere near that price range. That, uh, that compares. There's the other device that I've talked about quite a bit is from um, Telestream. It's the VDU Pro. It's $1,000 and it does essentially the same thing, but it has more options, meaning I can stream it to any platform on the planet. Um, it is smaller, lighter, battery powered. I can plug in a, um, a USB thumb drive, what do you call it? A, um, a, th a 4G stick, um, you know, broadcast, you know what I'm talking about, a little 4G. Wi-Fi stick thing into it and go live from there. Uh, very flexible, but that's it's $1,000, so it's over three times the cost. So yeah, I would say the X2 is probably the best bet if you're looking to take your program from an ATEM television studio and just go live, keep it simple and easy. Uh, bang for the buck, definitely the best thing that I've seen. There you go, hopefully that helps. Okay, um, Tuba Dylan says, I use GH4s. Let's get this back up here. I use GH4s for my studio live show. Awesome. <laughs> I love it when the comments go flying by. Where'd it go? Here we go. Use GH4s for my live studio show and have plug-in adapters so that I can run them continuously without worrying about batteries. Plug-in AC adapters you're talking about. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Sorry, was there a question in there? You had a question before. Uh, if there's a question in there, sorry, follow up with a question later. But yes, AC adapters are definitely, if you're going to be Either, whether you're shooting video for long periods of time or you just want to be keep the camera on for a live show or anything, AC adapters is the way to go. My, I've got a GH4 over here that is this close-up camera. That is a, it's, all this stuff is in the way, but anyway, that's my close-up camera. Also the overhead, that one here is also a GH4. Both of them are plugged into AC adapters and neither of them ever get turned off. They are just on permanently. So there you go. Yeah, none of the, neither of them ever get turned off. So it's great. Okay. Um, oh, which there's to be Dylan's next question. Do you think that leaving the GH4s on for days at a time in video mode could damage the sensor? No, it will not. The flip out screen or any other part of the camera? Nope, nope, no damage. Keep it running, no problem. Sean wants to bust out the video tripod. No, do that later. It's, that's not, it's not gonna be an exciting unboxing. No one wants to, wants to watch me put that together. Ground Zero says, pick one and why for portable live streaming, always going to YouTube, same channel, Webcaster X2, Video, or Video Pro. Okay, pick one and why. Portable live streaming. How portable? So that ground zero, that's a tough question because how portable do you mean? Do you mean in the sense of I want to take a rig, attach a live streaming thing to it and be 100% wireless, look ma, no strings, and go live? In which case the VDU Pro is your choice. I actually haven't used the VDU. I don't recall the differences between the VDU and the VDU Pro, but the VDU Pro is what I bought and there must have been a good reason or I wouldn't have spent the extra money. Um, if you wanna go truly wireless, battery powered, then you gotta do that. If you don't need to be battery powered, if, if portable means setting it up in a, uh, in a hotel room or you know, on location studio, both the video and the X2 do Wi-Fi and ethernet. Always go ethernet if you can. Uh, they both take in a single stream of HDMI and encode and go. The X2 requires additional things to get it up and running. You have to have an external keyboard. I have shown, I don't have it here with me now, but I have shown this tiny little keyboard. We'll link to it down below. It's super cool. It's, uh, it looks like a game controller. It's a tiny little keyboard with a tap, tr touchpad, trackpad on it. Um, so you need that and you need a monitor. So you have to have a monitor. Again, I have this crappy, crappy little LCD monitor for 50 bucks or something that I got on Amazon that's actually a backup camera for cars. It's super, super crappy, but that little kit with the X2 allows me to do a complete setup. But now we're talking about 
this much stuff and it does have to be powered by uh, an AC power adapter or some kind of extra battery you know, rigging up. So if you want truly, truly portable, you gotta go to the video. If you don't need full on battery operated, then get the X2. You'll save a lot of money, definitely. Even with having to buy this extra stuff, you'll still spend less than half the amount. Uh, Matthew Wolf, I'm heading to Australia mid this year. Let's get this up here. And want to get a micro four, four thirds lens for everything. Everything, what lenses would you suggest for the following? Oh, I see, okay, street, portrait, macro, and landscape. So are we talking about, um, about a single lens to do all that or multiple lenses? You said lenses, okay, what lenses would you suggest? Okay, ooh, man. Oh, I can like, can I spend as much money as I want here? Are we like, go ahead, spend it all, buy the good stuff? Um, favorite lenses for travel are the Leica 15 millimeter 1.7. Love that lens, so it's a 30 mil equivalent. Uh, it's very fast, very, very sharp. It's, for me, for street photography, that's a focal length that I really, really like. It's a little bit on the wider side. Some people prefer something a little bit longer, closer to a 50 millimeter equivalent. Um, but for me personally, I like that 30 mil. That is, to me, an ideal, perfect street photography camera uh, ca uh, lens. So I would recommend that for that. For portraits, you're going to want to go for a longer lens. The 42.5 millimeter, the Noctocron, the f1.2, is, of course, the money lens it is beautiful it's incredible it's sharp we did a video on that recently we'll link to that up here if you haven't seen that check that video out if you don't want to spend that much money though there is the 42.5 f1.7 which is a remarkably good lens for the money um, not as good as the noctocron clearly but it's still a remarkably good lens for the money really really good value macro you've got two macro lenses in the lineup you got the 30 mil and the 45 the 45 is a leica so it's a bit sharper also obviously a bit longer um, the 30 mil though is insanely sharp. I think both of them are very, very good choices. I wouldn't say, oh, you gotta buy the Leica one because it's Leica, it's that much sharper. I would say, in this case, buy whichever one is a focal length that makes sense to you. Do you want that 60 millimeter equivalent or the 90 millimeter equivalent? Do you want that little extra reach? Um, if you're shooting things like scorpions, <laughs> get the longer lens. Would you say, where are you going? Australia, <laughs> get the long lens. You don't get anywhere near those bugs, man. Get the long lens and just, uh, or get the, like a 400 millimeter lens, get the hell over there to take pictures of it. Uh, bugs yeah so the 45 millimeter land uh, macro lens and then landscape well so here's the thing with landscapes people typically ooh, I can speak people typically say landscape you got to have a wide lens but my good friend Sean Bagshaw who's been on the show a couple times before is an unbelievably awesome landscape photographer most of his stuff is shot with a long lens that's something I learned when I was out shooting with him I'm like oh you're shooting with a telephoto he's like yeah better um, Obviously it doesn't work for everything and he's got plenty of stuff that's shot with wide lenses as well. But a long lens in landscape may surprise you just because you can you really get that compression between the mountains that are here and the ones that are way back there. You're focusing in on a more specific part of the landscape. So don't discount that. However, uh, if you're just looking for a wide lens for landscape photography, I mean, the, the okay, there's a lens, what is it, the tw 12? 12 millimeter, is that? There's a Leica, wide lens that I haven't shot with. I think it's 12. Um, Lumix Leica, if I, if I type 12, is that gonna come? Yeah, 12, mil, 12 millimeter, right? Let me pull this up here and show it to you. Yeah, oh, no, that's not it. Maybe I'm wrong. No, 12 doesn't sound right now all of a sudden. Anyway, there is a wide, maybe this is it. There is a wide, yeah, yeah, this is it, okay. Uh, there we go. This lens, I have not shot with it yet, it is apparently gorgeous. This is the, so it's a Leica lens, 12 meters, so 24 equivalent, f1.4, so it's really fast, so you can get that low light, if you're doing low light stuff handheld. Um, that's a gorgeous lens. Now, if you had this, would you want this and the 15 f1.7? Ooh, tough, maybe not both, except the 15 1.7 is definitely a smaller and lighter weight lens, so if you wanna have that smaller, lighter package for that street photography. But that 12, that's supposed to be bum diggity lens. Now then if you want something wider, the new 8 to 18, which I'm still playing with, is beautiful. I've really been enjoying that. So there's the 8 to 18. That's obviously going to be quite a bit wider. So if you want something like that, that's a good option. Um, there's a lot of good lenses. A lot of good lenses out there. So hopefully that onslaught of information is helpful. CJ copies. Uh, the reason, by the way, I want to show this to you real quick. I'm using a new app for doing my switching. The same company that made the old app that I use, Strata, has made this new app that only does the macros. And you might notice that the buttons are bigger than I've seen, you've seen before. They're bigger and there's space between them. It makes it easier for me to find the right one. Um, but it's a four by four grid. My, my last one was a two by eight grid. And so 
I don't have in my head where the buttons are. Now I've rearranged everything so it makes sense, but that's why I'm going, uh, where is it? Because this is brand new the first time I think, or second time I've used it on a live show, and I keep forgetting where I put things. So, um, but yeah, if you're using the ATEM and, get in there, if you're using the ATEM and uh, you, you're triggering your show with macros, definitely get that thing. We'll, we'll link to that down below. It's in the app store. Uh, yeah, that's cool, okay. It's one of those shows. Moving on. CJ Opie says, do you think I can capture high speed photo with a Canon 600D, a bullet from a gun? Oh gosh, no. No, no, bullet from a gun type of a thing. It's not the camera, it's the flash. You have to have a super, super high speed flash to, to capture that sort of thing. And you have to have a sound trigger to trigger the flash. It's not like you can go three, two, one, someone pulls the trigger and someone else hits the flash button. Ain't gonna happen. What you end up with is, I've never done this, but my understanding of you have a laser trigger and the laser is essentially, the once the laser's broken, then it fires the flash and you can program in, it'll fire the flash at 100 milliseconds after it's broken. Obviously you calculate all the distance, the bullet travels at X speed, it breaks through the laser, and then a foot later or whatever, it passes in front of the lens and that time to dis time for that to travel is so long, so once it breaks the laser, that triggers the flash. And it has to be a specialized, very, very high speed flash, uh, I believe, to capture a bullet moving through time and space. So the camera doesn't matter. Because the camera is going to basically be in bulb. The camera is just going to be open shutter. The flash is what's going to fire it. So, so with your camera, to answer your question, yes, you can capture it with that camera, but you're going to need a lot more equipment to make that happen. But if you do it, let us know. I'd love to see it. I've never tried that before, mainly because I don't like guns. Um, Bruce Burton says, how is the 45 to 150 Panasonic lens for video on a G7? I don't know. Sorry, I have not worked with that lens. I cannot tell you firsthand how it is. Matt Driver says, I use the Blackmagic Studio into the X2. Oh, awesome. Cheaper, but you lose the SD recording of the Video Pro. Ah, excellent point. Thank you. I forgot to mention that, Matt Driver. Diver, thank you for pointing that out. The, the uh, X2 does not have recording, internal recording of your show, whereas the Video Pro does. Now, the X2 actually does have an SD card slot. It's just not enabled. So it's something that in theory will get added via a firmware update in the future, but Epifan hasn't said if or when it'll happen. It's just if you look at the hardware, it's there. So technically it could be done, but it's not yet. So I think that hopefully they're going to add that because that is a pretty awesome feature to have. The reason you want this, well, multiple reasons, if your live show gets completely borked and you just, you're like, ah, my live show fell apart, but it, you know the show must go on, at least you have that backup that you can pull out and re-encode and upload. Or if you want to re-edit your show later, you have a copy of the show that you can re-edit. Now, one of the things to know if you're doing this, if you're recording... Uh, if you're recording your live stream using the hardware that is doing the live streaming, and this goes for the, the Video Pro, I'm sure it will go for the, uh, for the um, X2 if it comes to that. This even goes for the Pearl. The quality of what is recorded is the same thing that is streamed. Okay, so you are streaming, let's say that you've decided to stream at 1080p at 6 megabit that encoded file is what gets written to the disk. So the hardware does the encoding at whatever bit rate, size, and so on you've determined, sends that off to the interwebs, and then also sends that to the memory card. If you want to record it at a higher quality, you can either, uh, like what I do here, is the show is recorded to ProRes because I've got another feed coming off of the switcher that goes into a recorder. I record the show to ProRes, and I've got a pristine quality copy to edit and upload for later. Or if you're using the Pearl, you can actually set a secondary stream of the Pearl because it's powerful enough that it can do multiple encodes simultaneously, and you can do a higher bitrate encode for that that writes to disk. It's got its own internal, I think, half terabyte hard drive. However, even the Pearl doesn't do ProRes. So if you want the best quality ProRes, you gotta do that separately and externally. Um, so if you were going to do some, if you wanted to do a ProRes capture using an X2 or a Video Pro, you would have to set that recorder in between your switcher or camera or whatever your sources are, in between that and the encoder. So right, so you'd have your camera or switcher or whatever. Then you'd have a recorder that has an input and an output path, and then you'd have your encoder slash streamer. So the video stream would come into the recorder, get recorded at ProRes, and then back out untouched. It goes back out untouched into the encoder slash streamer, and it gets shot off to the interwebs. So that's how you would do that. Uh, Sheila House. Hello, Sheila. There go my comments flying by again. Sheila, there we go. How do I get my preview on the GH5 to show the actual frame size? Is zoomed in or something and I cannot get back out. Oh, okay. So you're talking, you're right. She is, 
looking on the camera, looking at the picture, and has somehow zoomed into the picture. The thumb wheel. The thumb wheel on the, the top thumb wheel, the one that usually does shutter or aperture depending on the mode you're in, just scroll that and it will zoom back out. Zooms in, zooms out. So that's probably what you're running into. Just zoom right out of there. All right. Uh, somebody's uh, recommending Sling Studio. Yes, yeah, Sling Studio, check that out. I have not used the Sling Studio, but that is definitely a cool package as well. Willem Houtman says, should I use a battery grip for my G9? Shooting with the PL42 point, uh, Panasonic Leica 42.5, 1260, 1818, and 50 mil. That is 100% personal preference. Do you want to have dual batteries so you don't have to you have change batteries less often? Do you want the vertical grip? If you want those things, then go for the, the battery grip. If you're more concerned with having a smaller, lighter package, then don't put the battery grip on it. Just have extra batteries in your pocket. Uh, and if you don't, you know, obviously if you don't care about the vertical grip, total personal preference, but it's, it's a nice advantage, if it's a nice add-on, but if you're buying into Micro Four Thirds because one of the reasons being you want it to be smaller and lighter, when you start adding things like the battery grip on there, you are definitely getting your size up there again. So just something to consider. It's a great add-on. If you need it, perfect. Um, I, have it on, I have it for the GH5. I don't usually shoot with it on there. Uh, it's just not something that I usually need. I've got bags of gear around. I don't need to have two batteries in there. And I, I don't know, I guess when I shoot vertical, I just, I just do this. I don't need to have the full-on grip. So, but that's me. That is me. All right. Boom. Well, where'd it go? Um, comments, comments, comments. There we go. Tom Curley. Oh, hello. Tom is piping in saying my pick, uh, for, probably for the Australia trip, would be the 1440 f3.5 to 5.6 and a 15 mil Leica for low light wide shots. There you go. There's some more suggestions for lenses. Uh, Bernardo da Silva says, do you think Panasonic will release an improved version of the G85 and the GX85 with the 20 megabyte sensor soon? Okay, here's what I always say to questions about do I think, what are they going to do? First of all, I don't know, and even if I could, I couldn't tell you. So there's that. Um, being a Lumix ambassador, that's the kind of information that I may or may not have, but even if I had it, I couldn't tell you. Um, but then I always like to respond to these things with a snarky response. This is not direct. This is just in general because it's fun. Um, I like to say no. No, that is the best camera that they will ever release, and they will never make anything better. I used to work at Apple, and people would always ask me, is Apple working on a new laptop? No. The last one that came out was it. That's the last one they're ever going to do. So Will there be a replacement for any camera in the lineup in the future? Most likely, yes. Uh, if, unless the camera is a complete and total flop, then camera manufacturers tend to evolve that camera to the next generation. As far as when, your guess is as good as mine, but uh, there's always, always something else being worked on. No company in the world sits around and doesn't do anything else. So apologies for the snarkiness, but you know, that's just, that's just kind of the, the, what, goes, what goes with that question sometimes. Okay, Anthony Jackson says, vlogging, 7 to 14 or 8 to 18? Ooh, very good question. I know both is good if you had a choice, just one and why. 8 to 18. If I was vlogging 8 to 18, it has less distortion around the edges. So uh, if you see someone who's vlogging with a 7 to 14, they're doing, you know, obviously the personal pointing at themselves. That 7 at 7 millimeter gets a bit more distortion than the 8, uh, than the 8 to 18 at 8 millimeter. So that one extra millimeter of width doesn't make any difference, I don't think, for vlogging type stuff, and, uh, but the less distortion will look better. So I think the 8 to 18 is a better choice for vlogging. Uh, Brent Kaplan says, I have the 12 millimeter Leica. It's awesome. Fantastic. I gotta get my hands on one of those. I've never shot with it, but I know a few people who have it and absolutely love it. Uh, Bryant says, love watching your GH5 videos. Thank you. Would you ever do other videos on other cameras? You deserve way more subscribers. Well, thank you, Bryant. Send those subscribers my way. I will gladly take them. I don't have plans to do them on other cameras other than doing add-ons to the GH5 course for the GH5S. I'm gonna do an, a supplementary course for that. Um, obviously once I get the camera, but other than that, no, I don't have plans. Those take a lot, a lot of work and I can, like that GH5 training at gh5training.com, by the way, just in case you're wondering what in the heck he's talking about, gh5training.com, you head over there, you can check out my course. It is five and a half hours of very detailed, extensive training on the GH5. It is a $100 download, so it is not cheap, but I figure with the GH5, it's a $2,000 camera, you can spend 5% of what you spent on the camera to learn the training. But if I did one of these trainings for a smaller camera, let's say a $1,000 camera or a $500 camera, it, the training's gonna take just as long. It takes a lot of time and effort to put those together and it's really hard to, it's re I can't sell something like that at 100 bucks. People are like, oh, that's too much money. So could I sell enough at 50 bucks to make it worthwhile? Probably not, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of work, so no, I don't really plan on doing them. 
Uh, like I said, I'll do one for the GH5S. I don't plan on doing one for the G9. I've said on the show before, if you really want one, let me know. And I've had, I think, three people email me saying, yes, I'll pay. And one even said, I'll pay a little bit of money for that. And I thought, yeah, not, not really. That's not the answer I need. Uh, I can't sell three copies of something and, and you know, make a profit. So, so no is the short answer, uh, except for the GH5S. Obviously, anything could change, but I got plenty of other stuff going on, too. Fred Kaplan says an average 0.45 ACP. Um, I think you're talking bullets. It's traveling at 1,000 frames per second. If you're talking about bullets, um, wow, that's fast. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. Matthew Wolf says, bring this back up here. Is the Panasonic 200 2.8 worth the money, or do you think I should get a Metabones and grab a Sigma Canon Nikon? Oh, that's a fair question. I have not shot with the 200 28. Certainly, you could probably expect that your autofocus is going to be better on that. If you're shooting film stuff, you're talking Metabones, you're likely shooting manual focus, so it doesn't matter. Um, if you are shooting specifically for film type work, then I don't... I don't have a good answer for you, Matthew. I'm sorry. Um, I've not shot with that lens, and I haven't even shot with Metabones other than just playing with it a little bit, so I, I honestly don't have a good answer. That's a really good question, though. I think it's a very fair question uh, for which I wish I had a better answer for you than I don't know, but I'm not going to make something up, and so the answer is I don't know. Sorry. Bart Johnson Production says, when you have guests on the show via Skype, are you running Skype on a separate machine? Yes, I'm looking to start having guests on my show. Problem is I use OBS and will overload the CPU. Yes, I, absolutely. So if I have a guest like I did for last Friday's show when Don Komarechko was on. If you haven't seen that show, check it out. He showed off his snowflakes, talked all about photographing snowflakes. It was awesome. It's a long show, but really, really interesting. Uh, yes, he was Skyping. In. We're actually using Zoom instead of Skype now. It's more reliable for these things. But yes, that is a separate dedicated machine. So the way that's configured is I have a Mac Mini that is my chat machine. It's actually the same machine that you see right here. So I use that same machine for the chat as well as for Skype or, or uh, Zoom. And I put the guest full screen in front of me. So they're like, I'm looking at the comments that you're seeing here. I'm actually looking at them right here. They go full screen on there. And then that is piped in through the system through the switching. So um, for example here, if I go, let me do this real quick. Let me get off of there, do this. Um, okay, so let's pretend that, uh, nope, that's the wrong one. Let's pretend that the screen on the right, that is the desktop of the chat slash Skype Mac, that would be my guest. So that is a separate computer cropped and brought in. And then what I did for the show last week was I had a interview plus Mac. So we have the three of us on there. So there's me, there's my guest over there. And then down here is the Mac screen, which was showing the snowflake pictures. And so we did it like this setup. Um, but yeah, it is a separate machine. Absolutely. Every video source is a separate machine. That's, that's the way to get it. Keep it reliable, keep it consistent, keep it clean, and not overload your CPUs. Uh, uh, Capturing Media asks, how do we tip and super chat on the mobile device? You can't, but I do, do appreciate the, uh, the desire. Um, yeah, unfortunately, they haven't added that to mobile. Go figure. I don't know. I kind of have a feeling YouTube hasn't done much to promote that. It's like it's there, but they don't really talk about it. I heard once, I think, Ryan, didn't we hear that that was going away even? Um, I don't know. YouTube really needs to figure out how to help monetize their, their platform. CJ Opie says, if I want to review a GH5S for YouTube, how do I get in contact with Panasonic? I would like to say, don't call them, they'll call you. <laughs> I, I know that when it comes to these things, they reach out to the biggest YouTubers. Um, you know, but I, I, I don't know, sorry. What you might wanna do, I don't know if this would work, but you might wanna do is go to a local uh, retail store and see if they can have a unit that you can borrow for a day or two. Because if you're promoting them, you know, here's my GH5S, here's my review. If you're gonna buy one, go to this store to buy it. That might work out, right? This is how I do stuff with B&H. I have an agreement with B&H where they will send me pretty much anything that I ask for for a month, like this tripod here, and I then do reviews on it. I talk about it, yada, yada. And of course, I encourage you to purchase this product if I think it's worth purchasing. Um, I encourage you to purchase it from B&H. You can do that with a local camera store. If you walk into your local camera store and say, hey, here's the deal. I'm a big shot YouTuber. I got you know, 100,000 subscribers and um, your video, if I do a video on this, is probably gonna get 10,000 views or 100,000 views or whatever it is, then maybe you can sell them on it. That might be a good way to go. So, good luck. Ah, all right, that is the last comment. We are gonna end it there. Whew, that was a, that was a long one. Thanks a bunch, everybody, for tuning in today. That was a lot of fun. So remember, next uh, Wednesday, we are doing the show on the black and white 
photography using color filters. It's going to be a kind of a crazy fun thing to do so that we can, uh, well, again, we're going to do this live. We're going to show what it looks like when you shoot a black and white picture through color filters. I've got all these color filters here. See, I just, I just shot that little thumbnail picture this morning. So it's fun because we're going to do this live, right? I'm going to put the camera into black and white mode. You'll be able to see various scenes through the color. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be fascinating. We're going to talk about shooting JPEG, black and white JPEG, but shooting it raw, in which case the pictures turn up looking like, you see the top row on there, those are the raw pictures shot through the color filters, and then the black and white translations of them down below. Lots of different options. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, and that's what's gonna be Wednesday's show, which means I gotta go get some, do some prep work, get ready for it. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, looks like there was one more question. Oh, okay, here, one more question here that came up. Um, Mark, okay, two more questions. All right, all right, come on, let's just, who wants to go? Who wants to go have breakfast? Marvin says, "Could you show how to use filters to shoot directly at the sun? You need those special sun filters. Put them on and point at the sun. I don't have one, so I can't show it. But that's how that works." Um, Hagen, I see there was a question. Someone said to Hagen, "Bernardo, thank you. Reminding Hagen, you have to put my name in front of it so I see the question. But I see a question here. Hagen says, "Which micro four thirds camera is the king of low light? Ibis Plus Fast Prime." Okay, so. The king of low light is the GH5S, but that does not have in-body image stabilization. So the best low light with in, in, low body image, with stabilization maybe is probably the, is the G9 supposed to be any better? I think the G9 might have like a tiny, tiny edge over the GH5 for that. I don't remember. For some reason that's in my head. I think it's a negligible difference. I think that you'll be fine. I mean, GH5 or G9, either one of those is gonna be basically the same for low light photography. Um, so yeah, if still and if you're doing still photography only, you may as well go for the G9. If you want both still and video, uh, you know GH5 is obviously your your probably your prime choice. But if you're questioning which one of those to get, I'll point once again up here. Uh, we already linked to it. Just click on the little button up there, a little eye up there, and that'll uh, bring you to the video that I did last week or week before about the GH5 versus the G9s. You can really compare and side by side and see which one works out best for you. Okay, ah, that's it. Uh, Marvin says, which filter type do I search for? Ryan, what, what are the sun filters called? You bought one. And the, well, it's variable ND2 to 400, so you gotta get the super, super ND filter, I guess, for that. Um, and also put a UV filter on there, apparently. I'm listening to Ryan, Ryan's telling me what to tell you. Uh, I didn't shoot the Eclipse, uh, so I don't, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I don't have affiliate links for those, sorry. Thank you, I appreciate you wanting to purchase these. But if you, just FYI, anything that I don't have an affiliate link for, if you click on any of my affiliate links, and that takes you to say Amazon or b and and then you go buy something else, um, and as long as you don't click on somebody else's affiliate link, or you don't wait longer than I think 48 hours, then my cookie's still there and I still get credit for those purchases. So thank you very much, I do appreciate that. Okay, now we really are going. I gotta get out of here. Take care of yourselves, everybody. We'll see you on Wednesday for a big fun show, and, uh, and that's it, bye-bye.